it's really important that whenever you make a solution, you look at the label before you measure it out, make sure you're actually using what you think you're using, and look at the formula weight or the molecular weight. Here's a little bit more on why. Say you want to order some pizzas, and it's a really weird pizza place, and it charges you by weight. So you're trying to figure out how many pizzas to buy. So you take a pizza, and you weigh it out, and you figure out how much one pizza weighs, and then you multiply that by how many pizzas you want, and you place your order. Now your order comes, and you get fewer pizzas than you thought you were going to get. What happened? Well, apparently the company, they actually weighed out the pizza and the box. So the actual weight per pizza plus box is going to be higher than the weight per pizza. So basically you end up getting fewer pizzas than you thought you were going to get. Something similar can happen when we're dealing with salts and hydrates. Basically, with these molecules, we have the combined weight of the one of the molecules with its counter ion. So basically, in sodium chloride, you have a sodium ion and a chloride ion. And when you stick those in water, they dissociate, so they come apart, and you get those individual ions. If you were to measure the concentration based on one of those. So if you were to say calculate the weight of a sodium ion and then multiply that by how many ions there are or whatever, do whatever, whatever molarity calculations you want to do. And I talk much more about those in another post, but basically it's a way that we can um, say how much a num certain number of copies weighs. But if we do those calculations based on the weight of a, one of those ions, but not including the other, well, then when we go and we weigh it out, if that weighed out um, amount is based on the combination, then we're going to end up with fewer than we think that we should have. And so often what we're seeing when we're dealing with these um, these molecules is we're dealing with these salts. We're not dealing with individual sodium ions. If we were dealing with pure sodium, um, then if we stuck it in water, we'd get an explosion because sodium really wants to give up an electron. Um, and when it does this, it often, it, then it becomes the ion form. And so it can give up that electron to water and you get this explosion, or we can kind of allow it to give up that ion, that electron beforehand and give it to chlorine, which really wants an electron. And then they hang out together in what we call this like ionic bond. It's not a true bond. It's just an attraction. They're just kind of hanging out close to each other. And therefore, when we stick them in water, they can dissociate so they can come apart. So because it's not a full covalent bond, like the bond that you have between the glucose and the fructose in sucrose, so in a molecule, because they're not truly bonded, we're able to then dissolve them. But when we weigh them out, we're typically weighing out the sodium chloride as a unit, so we need to take into account the mass of the entire sodium chloride unit, and this is taken into account in something called the formula weight. Now you often see the formula weight, the terms formula weight and molecular weight used interchangeably, but the formula weight is basically the, um, the number of grams per mole of a thing. Um, when it's a formula weight, this takes into account um, things that dissociate. So you, when you're talking about the sodium and the chloride coming apart, um, those would be included in a formula weight. It's like what you're buying it as kind of. So it would be like the pizza and the box. With a molecular weight, well, he, so that was the formula weight. With a molecular weight, basically a molecule is something that's held together only by covalent bonds. So when you stick it into water, it's not it might dissolve, but it's not going to dissociate. So when you stick sucrose into water, you don't get glucose and fructose. You still get sucrose. So it's like your pizza never comes out of the box, which would make it hard to eat. But if you had then weighed out and based on the weight of a pizza plus a box, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. So if you have a molecular weight, then technically that's dealing with something that's a molecule. So something like um, sucrose, what you're going to see is you're going to see this MW, this molecular weight. And this is going to be um, the weight of the molecule. But you often see the terms molecular weight and formula weight used interchangeably, even in the case um, of a of something that should have be labeled as a formula weight, you often see a molecular weight. So where do we see these? We see a lot of salts in biochemistry. Just like we're not dealing with pure sodium, um, we're often not dealing with pure anything. We're dealing with the salt forms because these are often more stable, they're more soluble. 
um, all sorts of great things. And a couple of places where this is going to come up is with things like buffer preparation. So with TRIS, we'll go for an example, as well as with other molecules like, um, like when we're dealing with EDTA, which is this chelator molecule. So it's like this metal biter. Um, and it also comes up in various places when we have like hydrates, especially with metals. Um, so basically they hang out with water and then we have to take into account the weight of those water molecules, kind of like we have to take into account the weight of the box of pizza. Now, the most important thing to take away from this lab wise is that you need to be really careful and make sure that you're using the right concentration um, when you're doing your calculations. So what you want to do is you want to check the label of the bottle that you're using. Make sure it's what you actually think it's you're using. Often it's not really that big of a deal if you're dealing with like a tri so um, a trihydrate or a quattrohydrate or whatever. Basically, you might have different numbers of water molecules hanging out with your molecule, but the only difference it's really going to make is going to be in what the more molecular or what the formula weight is going to be. So what's most important is that you look at the bottle and see what the molecular weight or what that formula weight is on the bottle. That's going to be the formula weight um, for what you're dealing with. It's also really important that you keep those bottles tightly closed, those ones that are like hygroscopic um, solids, so things that absorb water, because if you, they absorb that water, even if that water is not on the label um, and it's not included in the for in the calculation of that formula weight, well, the, when, when you have that water dissolved, well, now you're making your thing heavier. And when you go to weigh it out, you're going to get less than you thought. So keep those lids tightly shut. That's also going to help you not have to be kind of like taking a one of those metal spatulas and trying to chisel away a little bit of solid so that you can make your solution. But let's go back and let's deal with some of these calculations and do an example. So one example is TRIS. So TRIS is a common pH buffer molecule that we use in the lab. And so basically a pH buffer is going to be able to keep the pH stable by giving and taking protons and much more on this in other posts. For now, just know that a proton is positively charged and tristan can give and take away this proton depending on the pH and if there's there are acids and bases around. In its conjugate acid form, tris um, is protonated and so it has this positive charge. If it gives up that proton, now it's going to be able to take a proton. It's going to be a base, so something that can take a proton. So an acid donates a proton, and a base gives a, um, takes a proton. And so they're the flip sides of the same coin. And so we can refer to the conjugate acid form of tris and the conjugate base form of tris. Now, this conjugate acid form of, of tris has this positive charge. And now if you think about this in water, that's all fine because the tris can hang out with the water. But what if you think about this in a solid? Well, in a solid, you're not just going to have a bunch of positive charges hanging out with one another. Instead, those positive charges are going to repel each other, right? So you need Tris to have a counter ion. You need to have something that's kind of negatively charged that this Tris can hang out with. And so often what we're dealing with is we're actually dealing with something called Tris HCl, where basically there's a chlorine molecule coming in and hanging out with that, with that positive charge. Now, we can actually buy the tris in either form. You can buy this tris base or you can buy this tris acid. And depending on what you buy, um, it, then when you dissolve it, you're going to get something with a different pH. And you can choose to do it that way. And then, um, or you can choose to just, I usually just start with the base. Then I do my calculations and I adjust the volume accordingly to get the, um, to get the, to get the pH that I want. And I have much more in preparing a tris buffer in another post. But for now, let's go back and let's think about what would happen if we prepared the tris based on the base or the, um, the formula weight of the base or the formula weight of the um, conjugate acid. So if we do the base, then we have a molecular weight of 121.14. And this would be technically a molecular weight because that's not gonna be coming apart. It's not gonna be dissociating. When, however, so this is going to be the mass of this whole thing. When, however, we have this acid form, this conjugate acid form, it's going to have that counter ion, that chlorine ion, and that's gonna add weight. It's like we add a pizza box. And so now we need to include the weight of our pizza box. We need to include the weight of that chlorine molecule. We get a molecular weight of 157.56. So we're gonna to have to weigh out more of this tris hydrochloride 
than we would at the tris base to get the same amount of this tris molecule, of this central tris molecule. Just like we would have to order a higher um, quantity of pizza if we're dealing with the pizza plus the box when we're doing our weight calculations. We're still going to get the same amount of pizza at the end, um, but we had to order more and potentially had to pay more if they're going to be also charging us for the weight of that box. So if we know what we're going to use, so we say we use that tris base, well, now we can then weigh that out. We do our calculations. If we want a one molar solution, we say, okay, well, how much is in a mole of tris? Um, how many grams is that? Remember, that's our molecular weight or that's our formula weight. Um, and we do our unit um, calculations and we end up figuring out that we need 121.14 grams of tris per one liter of solution. Um, so basically we dissolve, we adjust the pH, we adjust the volume. Remember that when you're making when you're making a solution, you need to remember that the liquid's gonna take that the solids take up space. So you add your stuff, you dissolve it in a lower volume than you think you should need, and then you, um, if you do you your pH adjustments if you need to, and then you fill up to the required volume. So in that way, you're able to make your tris. But remember that you have to look and make sure you know which of the trisses that you're dealing with. Um, and so if you want. Um, typically, I'm dealing with, I start with the tris base. You can start with a mixture of the base and the acid if you want something with a lower pH. I typically just start with the tris base and then add HCl to titrate it to the pH I want rather than get it already kind of um, already be bound to the to the tris HCl. You can also actually start with a mixture of both of these, the tris HCl solid and the tris base solid. But remember that you have to use different um, formula weights or molecular weights when you're calculating how much of each to add. So that was a TRIS example, and that's a common one that can tr trick you up. Um, another thing is that TRIS HCL, sometimes it goes by like the trade name of like TRISMA, but you don't have to remember all that. You just have to remember that you need to look at the bottle. Another time it's really important to look at the bottle is when, when you're dealing with EDTA. So EDTA, um, ethylene diamine tetracetic acid, is a chelator, so it's a metal biter. Um, it kind of bites down our metals and hides them, and so we can use this to um, kind of protect our molecules from things that require metals to work, um, such as nucleases, so things that can chew up DNA and RNA, and so we often add EDTA to keep those away. So EDTA is another one of those molecules that can kind of give and take protons. It can act as an acid and a base. And what we're typically dealing with is you have these um, carboxylic acid groups that can donate protons. And when they donate protons, they become negatively charged. So as you go to a higher pH where there's fewer protons around, the, the EDTA gives up those protons and it develops these negative charges. And so then it starts hanging out with sodium, um, to pro that, which provides the counter ion. So because you have these positive charges here, these are going to balance out, and these are going to balance out, so you get this neutral disodium salt. So a salt is just a positive and a negative that cancel, a positive thing, like so a cation, and a negative thing, an anion, that hang out together, so you get a neutral compound. And so this disodium salt of EDTA is what we're often dealing with. But what we're actually often dealing with is going to be the dihydrate of that. So not only is this EDTA, the central EDTA molecule hanging out with those sodium ions, it's also hanging out with two water ions. So we need to take into account the, the, the weight of all of this. So we need to take into account the weight of our pizza, the pizza box, and maybe that little pizza table that is in the center that keeps the lid from like squishing the pizza. So we need to take all those things into account. And so if we look at the bottle, for some reason, sometimes the bottles don't have the formula weight or the molecular weight written on them. In those cases, what you can do is you can take this cast number um, and search for that. Um, so you're going to get this kind of like long number with dashes. That's going to be kind of like the unique chemical identifier for that molecule. And you can go look that up. Be careful about just Googling the name. If you just Google, okay, what's the molecular weight of EDTA? It might give you the molecular weight of this anhydrous form, so this form without water when what you're really dealing with is this disodium EDTA dihydrate. Um, so make sure that you can type this in, or sometimes the cast numbers, you're more um, guaranteed to get the exact specific chemical that you're looking for. Now, once you know how what the weight of that is, so this is 372.24, well, now you can go and you can do your calculations and you can weigh it out and you can do all that good stuff. And just a side note about when you make EDTA stock solutions, these are kind of a pain because they don't dissolve unless you add NaOH. Um, and so I have a whole post on preparing the EDTA stock solutions.
There's also something called like a tetrasodium EDTA tetrahydrate, where if we go back to this idea here, you have basically these nitrogens are going to get deprotonated at a really high pH, and then you hang out with four sodiums. But we typically don't use this because only if you dissolve that, the pH would be way, way, way too high typically. So that is just a note that you have these different forms. And so each of these is going to have a different molecular weight, a more different, um, so you, they call it a molecular weight, but really it's a formula weight in this case. Um, so you can see that you're going from like 292.24, you add some water and salts, you get to 372.24, and then you add um, some more salts and you get to 452.23. And so you have these different weights for each of these different things. And so when you go and you make your calculations, you need to make sure that you're looking at the label of your thing and know exactly what you're using. So hope this helps and remember to check your labels before you go and you make your solution. This is especially important if you're just like going off of a formula that you get. If you look online for a recipe, and I'm not saying don't look online for recipes. I often look online for recipes um, because I want to know if there's special things I need to know, if there's special things like for EDTA where you have to add the NaOH, if I want to know what are the storage conditions, do I need to filter this, do I need to autoclave this? So looking at the recipes can be really, really helpful, but those calculations, you need to make sure that they're using the same starting chemical as you are. So you need to make sure that you're using the same thing, that you check the molecular weight on your bottle, not just um, what Google tells you. And so hope that helps and good luck making your solutions.